Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, gave her father 41. Like that. (laughs) Welcome to the Lizzie Borden Podcast, Episode 8. The Lizzie Borden Podcast is a Nine Muses Books production. This is the only podcast devoted to Lizzie Borden and the Borden murders of 1892. Episode 8. The Historic Fires of Fall River. Welcome to the Lizzie Borden Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Behrens. I'd like to start out by inviting our listeners to visit LizzieBordenGirlDetective.com and sign up for our newsletter. This month, we have an exclusive preview of the new girl detective novella, The Audible Amnesiac, which is soon to be published by Nine Muses Books in a volume with four other Lizzie Borden girl detective stories. The newsletter also includes articles, author notes, and other writings that will appeal to Victorian and cozy mystery fans alike. Also, I'm pleased to announce that The Agitated Elocutionist, one of the most downloaded Lizzie Borden Girl Detective mysteries, is being produced as a radio play and will have its premiere on this podcast in early 2017. We're working with a great cast of actors who are really bringing this story to life. Keep posted about the play at LizzieBordenGirlDetective.com, the official website for the most excellent girl detective of Fall River. Today we have a show exclusively about Fall River history. We talk about the historic fires of Fall River. I've been buying Arcadia Press Images of America books for years. The formula for the books is to use local writers and historians to author books about their community with a heavy emphasis on historic photographs. The history of a region would be told in the introduction and the photo captions, whether it's a large town of historic significance like Princeton, New Jersey, or a county seat like Doylestown in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, there's an Images of America book for it. There's even Images of America books for the Wawa convenience store chain and LaGuardia Airport in Queens, New York and the White Mountain District in New Hampshire. There are hundreds more that cover the country. There are books about regional history, examining the way America has grown, how it's changed, and how communities in the U.S. identify with their rich history. Arcadia also publishes a series of books about railroads, about baseball, about postcards, and about local legends. Their popular Then and Now series contain old photographs of a community and are compared to recent photographs taken at the same location up to 100 years later. In 2014, Arcadia Press bought a subsidiary called The History Press. The books of The History Press focus on a wider range of American history, including unsolved murders, local and urban legends, historic mysteries, and as they phrase it, everything in between. It's a great complement to the regional community-focused Images of America series. So, how does this all fit in with Lizzie Borden? Well, there are several Fall River-related books published by both presses. Arcadia has two Fall River Images of America books. The History Press published Wicked Conduct, an excellent book on the unsolved murder of mill girl Sarah Cornell in Fall River in 1832. Neither press has done a Lizzie Borden book yet, but Dr. Stephanie Corey of Fall River, Massachusetts, a lifelong Lizzie Borden researcher and Fall River historian, has published not just with Arcadia Press, but now the History Press as well. Her 2012 Fall River Revisited is a must-have addition to any Fall River history collection. Stephanie wrote the book and compiled the photographs with the help of the Fall River Historical Society and the Fall River History Club, and the book's a great complement to the first Fall River Images of America book. In 2015, Stephanie published a more focused Fall River book with the History Press, The Historic Fires of Fall River. Information about these historic fires have been scattered in various sources, but Stephanie has brought them together into one vivid and moving volume, filled with photographs sourced from private collections and city archives. It's a book about a city that was said to have been built to burn, a phrase I'll explore with Stephanie in a few moments. Dr. Stephanie Corey has a long-celebrated history with both the Borden Affair and Fall River. She is the founder and publisher of Pear Tree Press, specializing in Borden titles, true crime, and Fall River history. Her portal website at lizzieandrewborden.com contains the Lizzie Borden Society Forum, a virtual Lizzie Borden Museum, and the blog Mondo Lizzie Borden. 
Dr. Corey has served as an editor for the award-winning History of Lizzie Borden and Fall River, published by the Fall River Historical Society, Parallel Lives, A Social History of Lizzie A. Borden and Her Fall River. And of course, she's the author of Fall River Revisited and The Historic Fires of Fall River. This is her second appearance on the show. Dr. Stephanie Corey, welcome to the Lizzie Borden Podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I believe you were here about five years ago, but from the listener's point of view, it was only a mere seven episodes, I believe. Yeah, I think that's how it worked. <laughs> Episode number one, The Dog Girl. That's right. Well, welcome back. Thank you. For the past couple of weeks, we've been doing the Lizzie Borden Primer, which is was a series designed to give beginners an introduction to the whole Lizzie Borden phenomenon, her life, the trial, the crime, and... F- Now we're going to start our work on Fall River in general. You've just published a book, The Historic Fires of Fall River. Could you tell us a little bit about that? It just came out early this year, and it's published by Historic History Press. Uh, And I'm really quite proud of it. It was a a book that they asked me to pitch to them and because they had previously published through their sister publishing company, Arcadia Press, an images series book called Fall River Revisited, Images of America. And I had a really good time doing that, and it made a lot of money for them. Of course, authors don't get hardly any of that, but apparently Fall River sells no matter where because people are from here, not necessarily living here, so it's quite popular. So they asked me to pitch a couple of more titles to them, and I came up with this fire idea because there hadn't been a book about it. They got very excited, and they gave me a time frame and a contract, and I sat down and started writing it. It was the most enjoyable process and writing experience I had with any book that I've ever written. It just was complete research, something I knew very little about to something I ended up knowing a bit about and quite a bit about later. So I interviewed people. I did my own research. I found information. I purchased old documents. I got in touch with people not from here, but know a lot about fire and learned about this process of firefighting. You know, I I was a naive person. I thought I didn't even know that there's different apparatus to fight fire. I thought you plug into a fire hydrant and you blow the water and you put the fire out. I had no idea how all that process worked. And so I was lucky to have the input and the help of uh, David Jennings, who's a retired district fire chief with the city of Fall River. And he was uh, my advisor, and he wrote the introduction to the book. So he was the guy that I could throw stuff to and say, does this make sense? Am I wording it properly? Am I using the right terminology? Explain how this ice worked in 1843. And he could tell me because that was his life. So that was extremely helpful. Is that the same David Jennings at the uh, Lafayette Durfee House? He is. And I think he's the education director. He he, um, is looks great in short pants, let me tell you. He dresses up as a pirate, as a colonial fighter. He does Civil War talks. He's amazing. He's great. He does educational things with the school system and uh, teaches kids about the history of Fall River through actual hands-on, you know, you touch the items, the cannonballs, the, the Civil War medical equipment, you know, pirate booty and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, that's that, that's Dave. He's He's just very involved. Now, there have been many fires in Fall River over the past 150, 200 years, uh, many of which you don't have time to cover in your books. But the big fires that stand out were, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm extrapolating this from the book itself, the Great Fire of 1843, the Granite Mill Fire of 1874, the Steiger Store Fire of 1916, the Great Fire of 1928, and the Notre Dame Fire of 1982. So we have these five fires. These are the ones that we're going to focus on today. Is it fair to say that those were the uh, significant fires out of the 200 plus that you have listed? There's actually, there are actually more. I was limited in the number of words I could use in this book because they have a format for that. I, I left out the Borden Mill Fire, which was a big deal, which is where Arlen's store was. I left out a major uh, a major fire, the Firestone Fire, which happened in the 40s, which then was repeated later at the same location in the 70s, another fire at the same location that was big. I left out a major investigation of the Kermill Fire. So there were other major fires that I just couldn't put into the book itself because of space limitations. 
they told me to stop. And I was like, no, there's more. And they're like, no, stop. So there's a possibility of future publications, I guess, out of that. Well, the book starts off with a very provocative statement. And I'd like you to explain like where the statement comes from and then tell me what it means to you. The statement is, Fall River is a city built to burn. That was spoken by Fire Chief Louis Shea, who fought the fire, the uh, Notre Dame fire, was one of his big fires, also the Borden Mill fire. He felt, as did other fire police, fire chiefs in the area that there there had to be a reason why there were so many specific fires at Fall River because both Lowell and New Bedford also have mills, but they don't have nearly the number of big fires that Fall River has. In my research, I found that uh, since 1813, there have been over 100 significant fires in Fall River. That's significant. That doesn't mean loss of life. It means significant in terms of loss of jobs, loss of financial finances for the companies that were involved, buildings, neighborhoods, and loss of life. So it is, that is the case. And the reason why I think through my research is that it's location, 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 as is with anything. Uh, Fall River sits on the west side of uh, a giant basilithic granite ledge that was formed during the Ice Age. So we sit here on granite. And the winds are generally westerly and at times really gusty. We get wind storms here without rain. I'm from Florida and those things are so strong. Uh, they remind me of tropical storms and hurricanes. They're quite wild to see just wind. And wind in Fall River always is an ally of fire. In addition, the mills here are mostly over 100 years old, the ones that are left. And they were built for cotton manufacturing work. So there's multiple floors of essentially 100 to 250 feet long with 15-foot ceilings made of, and the floors are made of wide pine planks, which absorbed the oil dropped and spilled from machinery that was in use over the decades. So you've got this combustible location. You've got a weather pattern, and you've got the location of where the fire, the, the city itself sits. So because of that, fires in Fall River tend to create their own weather pattern, which is another thing in and of itself, which is remarkable to when it's described to me, including tornadoes of fire and backdrafts and things like that. Mills that have been retrofitted and sliced up in order to make available other businesses use in these old mills create these air spaces and vertical holes like chimneys or elevator shafts. And fires tend to start in cellars and then the balloon frame construction just makes it go all the way up to the top very quickly. Homes and buildings in Fall River were built with balloon frame construction, so there's no fire stops. And any insulation that had been put in there 100 years ago has has leached out, and there's no fire retardants in them anymore. So the problem becomes where the fire just completely engulfs the building in a very short amount of time. What's a balloon frame construction? It means that there's a space between the inner wall and the outer wall of the house. Oh, I see. It goes all the way up and down. Yeah. So there's no fire stop. So if a fire happens, stay in the cellar or the first floor, it can immediately go up to the attic through the frame, through the balloon construction of the house itself. There's I see. a passageway that exists between. It just flies up there. And, and fire is spread by fire sparks and fire cinders and moving with the wind and it creates further fire where those cinders land so a house can be engulfed very quickly i see the earliest fire that you refer to uh, of significance is the great fire of 1843 now in 1843 fall river was not yet incorporated as a city yeah in 1843 fall river was still a town and not incorporated into a city yet it had about 7,000 inhabitants. It had been founded 40 years prior in 1803 when a petition was granted for it to separate from the town of Freetown to the north. So in July 1843, when the first major fire happened in Fall River, there were 7,000 inhabitants and a, a robust and vital downtown business district that was centered around the Quickachan River, which was the birthplace of sort of the mill system in Fall River because the Kukishan River has a series of waterfalls that create energy, of course, and the early mills were powered by the motion of the water from the waterfalls. 
So mills were built directly over the water. So And that cuts the city right in half, so that that river did. And that's where the business district was. And the, people lived there, people had shops there, and business concerns there. So it was a big deal when that, when that fire happened. It was a very hot day. That day it had been, there'd been a drought all summer long. High winds close to a gale, again, blowing from the southwest, which I mentioned earlier, wind is an ally of fire. The water actually in the Quickishan River had been shut off to allow repairs in some of the mills, so they had actually stopped the flow. And that was the water supply for that area. So without that water, you had a problem fighting the fire. And it was not a, obviously not a time to go mucking about with gunpowder, which is really what happened. This was the afternoon of July 2nd, 1843, and you talk about two boys playing with a toy cannon in a warehouse. Yeah, it was a very hot, dry Sunday, and these two little boys who some say should have either been in church or under parental supervision, they were celebrating the coming of the 4th of July, uh, which was in two days hence, and they were playing with a toy cannon in an open space in the rear of a large three-story warehouse. And they shot this little cannon off, and the sparks from the cannon uh, ignited kindling nearby and draw, and whoosh, there you had your fire. Mm. In terms of what's there today in Fall River, what, what would be the boundaries of the area that was destroyed? The Great Fire of 1843 covered approximately 20 acres of land. Loss of buildings was estimated to be $265,000, and this is 1843 money. It created a homelessness that was unheard of, if you think about it. With a population of 7,000 people, 1,300 people became homeless because of the fire, which is a good 20% of the population. So it was devastating for the city. It was devastating for the young community. And it was a disaster, quite a disaster for Fall River. Fire alarm was given around 4 p.m., which really amounted to the shouting and ringing of bells because there was no formal fire alarm. And the Fall River Fire Department had been established formally 1832, and it's all volunteer. So the members were elected under approval of fire wardens, but attendance was mandatory at fires, which I thought was interesting. And if you didn't attend, you were fined 50 cents for non-compliance, which was quite a bit of money back then. Members did receive a small yearly compensation, but it just generally amounted to the cancellation of their poll tax. So the first engine in Fall River was bought in 1818. Um, it was a bucket engine, which means, see, when I read bucket engine, I thought, oh, it's an engine with buckets on it. It actually <laughs> is, you know, it, it is what it sounds like, but the the way that these early equipment, or which they're called apparatus, functioned to be amazing because it required such manpower, physical strength and manpower. A bucket engine sprays water with force, but you need a bucket brigade to make the bucket engine work. So the bucket brigade is a line of men who pass buckets of water from one to the other, which threw into a tub on the top, and then a piston pump which was operated manually by pushing up and down the long bars, which are called pumping arms, were used to force the water into a nozzle or a stroke. And the full up and down motion is called a stroke, and there's 60 strokes a minute, and you can only do the job for a few minutes at a time. So we're talking about major manual labor in order to get the water from the water source into the bucket, into the tub, through, and then pumped from that. Was this just one bucket brigade and one nozzle per fire? Yes, in 1843 it was. So they're fighting a fire that is spread out over 20 acres of the city with one nozzle. Yes, but then you also have people who have their bucket, citizens have their own fire bucket. That's true. And they would fight their fires on their own location and their own place. And businesses had fire buckets and mills had fire buckets. They, in 1843, they had one suction hand engine, one bucket hand engine, one bucket carriage, one small hook and ladder truck, and one rapid engine stationed on 2nd Street near where the fire started. And waters were supplied from a well from that location. So there were very few pieces of equipment that were in use in the fire department at that time. So really the only means of fighting that fire were hand engines and bucket brigades. You mentioned a suction hand engine. Is that, what is that? Is that what you were referring to before with sucking the water into the nozzle? Yes. The suction hand engine, yes. 
So the, the, the bucket engine would actually provide the buckets? Yeah. The, well, the bucket brigade, the bucket carriage brought the bucket. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, uh, the bucket hand engine was the one that you pumped. And then the suction hand engine was another uh, hand engine by hand. You had to pump it with your hand that provided suction for the water to be sprayed. So essentially, I guess you'd say there were two. And that suction hand engine is the one that would require 60 strokes per minute. Yeah. And the person doing that would probably collapse some exhaustion after a couple of minutes. It wouldn't be a person. It would be a brigade of people. It would oh, be four or five or six people or two people or four people doing it because the arms are very long. It's a, it's a long piece of equipment because the more motion that you can get. So they took turns. I think of it like Ben Hur with the, with the, you know, oh, the ramming sl- the boats. Sl- the slave yeah. galley. Yeah. I mean, if you think about <laughs> it, the physical, the actual physical, and you're still talking a 90 degree temperature, the heat from the fire, things are burning and you've got to, do this physical labor in order to, I mean, it's just, it's unimaginable to me. And amazingly, it was over by midnight and there was not a single loss of life. Yes, that's, that is amazing. Not a single loss of life, but a couple of uh, days later, we had one, yeah. casu- one casualty. A very important person. Yeah. Tell us about that. Major Bradford Durfee, who was the chief fire warden actually he died suddenly a week later now, his death was attributed to overexertion in fighting the Inferno. And his son was BMC Durfee. He was an infant at the time. And BMC plays a big role in the history of our city in Fall River. Later, uh, BMC Durfee High School is named after him because Bradford Durfee's widow invests and builds that, that high school in honor of her son who dies as a young man. And if you take a tour of the Fall River Historical Society today, you'd be able to see portraits of BMC Durfee, a, a marble bust, and his death mask. He became, I believe, the wealthiest man in Fall River at that point by inheriting that money from that family. Well, it ended up, I think, his mother became the most wealthy person because he died so young. And she ended up having his money as well. So I see. In, a, in a sense, the wealthiest person in the city was his mother. But in it, it, to get back to the fire for a second, in an effort to express the city's determination not to let this catastrophe stop them from succeeding as this community that was up and coming, the townspeople created a banner and they hung it over the heart of the ruins and the message they wrote on it was, we'll try. And in 1854, when Fall River was incorporated as a city, the 11th city in the Commonwealth, and by that time with 12,000 inhabitants, they used that that quote will try in the seal of the city as the city's motto. But it's interesting. The city's first official mayor was James Buffington. who's also a former fire warden and chief engineer in the fire department. So fire history is incorporated into the incorporation of the city. It's incorporated into the, uh, to the symbols of the city. It's incorporated into the, the, the DNA of the city. Let's put it that way. Now, mayor Buffington is also the father of, Adelaide Churchill, who figures prominently in the Lizzie Borden murder affair. Isn't that interesting how that all works out? Because the house next door to 92 Second Street was known as the Buffington House. Mm-hmm. So I think Mayor Buffington killed Andrew Borden. <laughs> 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 no, I wouldn't go that far. Um, <laughs> there, <laughs> there was one more casualty of the fire. We talk about the unfortunate passing of Major Bradford Durfee as a result of the injuries he sustained as a result of the fire. But there was one more casualty. It was someone who was who had died a second death. There's a hint right there. Oh, of course. The skeleton in the armor. Yes. <laughs> yeah, tell us that story. Oh, my goodness. The skeleton in the armor. What an interesting, weird story that is. In 1831, Mrs. William Cook, who was the aunt of Andrew Borden, who was the father of Lizzie Borden. So once again, we have a Lizzie Borden connection with this. She was digging in the bank of the Quickishan River near Hartwell, Hartwell and Fifth Street for sand to scour her pots with. And the story goes that a section of the bank of the, of the river gave way and she was soon staring face to face into the empty eye sockets of the human skull. And her husband and a clockmaker, John Orswell, assisted her in removing the sand from around this thing that she found. And the skull, the attached skeleton was found in a sitting position, was unearthed. And 
it was considered, it was called the skeleton in the armor and it, because it actually was in some form of armory, leather and metal. And it was made famous by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who wrote the skeleton in the armor. And now his brother, Samuel Longfellow, was a minister in Fall River. His congregation was here. So he visited Fall River and visited the skeleton in the armor. And when it was on display, then wrote this massive sort of story poem about it, epic story poem, where he kind of combined it with Viking imagery and sort of made it a, a metaphor for the birth of this country in a way. And it became world famous because of that. And the skeleton, the armor was on display in a building that was destroyed by the fire. So it was destroyed at the time. There's just a tiny little piece of a piece of leather from the armor that still exists that the Fall River Historical Society still has. So was it believed that the skeleton was a Viking? Oh, yes, because they wanted to, there was this whole mythic, where did, who were the early pioneers of this area? There was this whole, uh, there's this rock in Dighton called the Dighton Rock that there have been theories about, you know, the carvings on it and the, the where they come from. The, there's been a positive that there've been Portuguese early settlers here. Then there's this ruins in Newport that is basically a windmill, but somebody said it was a Viking uh, monument. And so there's this, and plus the Vikings were in North America, mainly up towards Nova Scotia. So there was this idea that the Vikings had come to Fall River and actually been here and that this was a Viking when, when it basically was an Indian of some kind and buried in the seated position which was typical, I guess, of that era. There's nothing unusual about it. It's just one of the few that were found, and they didn't know a lot about it in 1843 and 18 earlier. So all kinds of wild ideas came out of it, that it was some kind of Viking from Norway who had come and died here, and this was proof. You know, I saw a documentary on the History Channel, if the word documentary is accurately describes it rather than fiction, but there's a series called Unearthed America, which is done by a quack archaeologist who tries to prove every which way that the America was first colonized by the Knights Templar. Yeah, that windmill in Newport, it had its own episode where he proves beyond a shadow of a doubt it was built by the Knights Templar. No, it was a windmill. <laughs> it represents the uh, the secret map to their treasure. <laughs> I guess I guess everybody likes a good conspiracy theory, right? Yeah, well, it, that one was on the History Channel, so it's got to be true. So we we don't have any photographs. It's too early for photographs of the skeleton and armor, but we have drawings of it. Yes, there's sketches and drawings of it. So a lot, most sober people believe it to have been an Indian. Yes. But it was sad. But it was sadly destroyed, and it would have been cool if it was still, ex- in ex- you know, existing, so that we could go look at it and they could do further studies, and it could disprove the problem with it. Is the the mythology of its origins live beyond the actual item? So there's no way to to examine it further and to make some kind of learned pronouncement about its DNA or its uh, construction or who it was, all we have are stories and drawings. Sure, and Longfellow was just being fanciful in his own yes. Longfellowing way. Long, Longfellowy way. <laughs> Longfellowy, yeah. You're a poet, you're a poet, you don't know it, your feet show it, they're Longfellows. <laughs> I just went to his house in uh, Portland, oh, yeah? Portland, Maine, yeah. Took a tour of his house. They uh, They worship him up there. I bet. Yeah. Yeah, we have we have no we have no one to worship here in Fall River. Yeah, does Fall River have a poet laureate? No, mainly people are raised here and move away. I see. So, uh, so like uh, Springsteen's relationship to Freehold, New Jersey. <laughs> so, the Great Fire of eighteen forty three. There were fires after that, and the next Great Fire that you speak about is the Granite Mill Fire of eighteen seventy four, which, unlike the last fire, did result in a considerable loss of life. This is a terribly sad story. It is, and interesting, the things that I've read about this fire were tragic enough in, in the stories that I, that I read. But then when I did some primary research into it, I read the inquest that was published 
after the fire and the testimony of various people involved and come to tell a different story, actually, than what has been recorded in other scholarship and other historians' research. It's remarkable to me that people who write big books and have PhDs and stuff don't go to the original sources, but instead rely on other people's interpretation of the what happened. And I've come to find out that, especially with the fire stories in Fall River, that there's people who are obviously protecting their own reputations and their professional positions by how they present their story about what happened when they're directly involved and who they're working for matters. If they're working for the mill, they're protecting the mill owner. If the worker who is not protecting anybody but his own life has a different perspective of what happened and is more likely to tell the real story about what happened and not making this as out to be a hero. So in this particular case, this, this fire, there was a loss of life and it was mostly mil- women and children who jumped to their deaths or from the from the top floor of the mill because there was no other way out uh, or were burned in the fire itself. So this was a very sad day for the city. Um, it started on a Saturday, believe it or not. And yes, mills work seven days a week. Uh, so the Granite Mill fire was named after the Granite Mill, which is at was at 12th Street between Pleasant and Bedford. And yes. it was named after the granite construction material that the mill was, was made out of. Yes, they, it was milled on site. The mill itself was made of granite that was quarried on site. And two features that struck me when I, when I was reading your book was that uh, despite being five and a half stories tall, there was the only entrance to the building was the central tower, and there was a single yes, fire. Stairway. There was a single fire escape that only went to the fifth floor. Despite the fact that four hundred operatives worked in the mill, many of which were women and children, and the fire started at early in the morning, six fifty. Even though I'm sure most people were at work already by that point, on September nineteenth, eighteen seventy four. Let, let's see. Can you tell us the story? Well, um, the Granite Mill was the first mill that was established during the Civil War period, and it was number one. There were two mills, number one and number two, and we're talking about mill number one. It was 328 feet long and 70 feet wide. It had a steep pitched barn roof and an attic with windows that opened to the roof. Single fire escape, as you said. It had... 33,866 spindles and 860 looms. It was built in accordance with the best plans then in use and was regarded at the time as a model of its kind. On the first and second floors were weaving apparatus containing 500 looms each and a machine shop. On the third floor was carding and roving. On the fourth and the fifth was spinning. And in fact, on the fifth floor, there were 64 spinning wheels. And in the attic, the apparatus for drawing in, spooling, slashing, and warping, and a pair of mules. And it was on this floor that the, the largest number of persons were employed compared to the others because the other ones had, were filled up with machinery that could be operated. One person could operate many pieces at a time, whereas the top floor, the apparatus for drawing, spooling, slashing, and warping required more people to operate it than less people. So we had 400 operatives uh, working that day, and child labor laws were not enforced. In 1842, Massachusetts had passed a law limiting child work day to 10 hours. Can you imagine? They could still work, but you could only work them 10 hours a day, but it wasn't consistently enforced. Child labor laws never came into really federal effect until 1938. So this fire had something to do with pushing that forward. But again, not a great deal. It wasn't until much later with Lewis Hines and his work photographing child labor in New England and in the South that child labor laws actually awakened this consciousness in the United States that this is the wrong thing for our children to be doing. They should be in school. So in 1874, when this fire broke out, the population of Fall River was about 45,000. And 32% of all adults, both male and female, worked in the mills. So that's quite a big amount of people that were employed by by the industry of Fall River, which was cotton manufacturing. So the blaze appeared to be small when it first started. It was caused by a friction spark that kindled some cotton 
and it broke out in the north end for a fourth floor mule room in a pair of mules. And a 17-year-old operator, Dennis Leary, he had been a spinner and he just picked the picked the roller and oiled it to get it ready to go into production. And a spark happened when the machinery was started and a fire broke out. So it's a sad story because he tell he survived the fire and he told about what happened and about how he attempted to fight the fire. And at first the blaze appeared to be very small and extinguishable and he attempted to put it out with an available pail of water, one of a hundred that were alleged to have been located strategically throughout the building and were required to be there. And there have been fires before in the mule heads and a bucket of water usually put the fire out. So it wasn't thought to be a major problem when it first started. It wasn't casual about it, but it wasn't going to be a bad thing as it turned out to be. So it happened so fast and he tried to get more water, but in a short pause of trying to get the water, threads connected to the mule caught fire and almost instantaneously conveyed the blaze to all the mules nearby, causing the flames to form a complete and impassable wall of fire from one side of the room to the other. They swept up the 15 feet to the floor above. So Leary grabbed a hose attached to his mule alley and he opened the stop cock and a valve and told the men to go down and start donkey engine to provide the flow of water. So you had to, you had to pump the water up from the cellar into the hose that was attached to the wall. So they had to start the mechanism in order to get the water to flow. And so the water didn't start fast enough. So he gave the hose to another worker and rushed to the valve near the mule and opened it expecting water because it was time and no water came out. So he took the hose again and sent a man to order the water be turned on a second man. And in that short space of time, the empty hose actually caught fire. So it forced him to flee. And by this time, all the machinery was an operation on the fifth floor in the attic, and they didn't hear anything that was going on downstairs because of the noise of their own machinery and operation. All those people on the fifth floor and in the attic were essentially trapped at this point. Yes, because the fire began on the north side, which was where the fire tower stairway was, and it swept along to the south side, so there was no escaping down the stairway. It was impossible. So the fire alarm was, was raised at 6.55 a.m., and we had a problem here because at the same time, it was first alarm was at box 72, and at the same time on box 74, a fire alarm was given, which caused trouble on the trappers in the engine houses, and they couldn't find the location of the fire because of that. They sort of cross-circuited each other out, so there was a delay in getting the fire department there. In addition, the hook and ladder that arrived was of no use at all because the ladders didn't reach the upper floors. They weren't long enough. So bystanders who were standing around watching the fire had the bright idea of getting bedding. So everybody went to their homes and their apartments and they grabbed mattresses and bedding and sheets and anything they could do and they laid it out on the ground and for people to jump onto who needs to escape from the fire. So those that did jump died from spinal injuries crushed skulls, broken bones, and shattered bones. Yeah, they, they had to jump They had to jump up to uh, distances of 50 feet. Yes. Which was uh, not good. No, it's very, very sad. And, and there's, a, there's a story uh, that I tell about a good, a good, it's actually sort of a good story, but it's a, it's a gripping story. A, a little girl named Katie, she said, throw me out of the window, said little Katie firmly. I don't want to be burned. So Maggie, her sister, took her in her arms and heaved her out of the window to drop to the ground 65 feet below. As she was about to let her go, she observed a woman going down from another story on a rope and being afraid that she would knock her off the rope. She waited, holding her sister patiently until the woman was safe. Then she dropped her sister down where the crowd below had removed her. She climbed out the windowsill and jumped down herself without the slightest hesitation. And the two children uh, were survived. The smaller one was bruised and her breastbone was bruised, but the younger one broke her ankle and received several bruises, but they both survived. But that wasn't the case for most of the people dropping out of the sky yeah, out, that was, of, out that of the window. That was the exception, not the rule. That was the exception, not the rule, exactly. The uh, fire was finally extinguished at 3 p.m. When all told, there were 23 dead. And as I said, the children were ages 
10 to 12, and the women were ages 12 to 21. It was 30 plus serious injuries, so we're not we're just counting the dead on this one. But the the mill operatives blame the managers for the lack of water and the lack of escape routes, and the mill owners actually blame the operatives. That's incredible for not having the presence of mind to warn those on the sixth floor of the fire, and for fleeing in fear and haste, and for not helping women and children to safety. The fire department was criticized for not being able to rescue the workers or having apparatus. That that was long enough in order to survive and to help people survive. So at the coroner's inquest, there were 49 witnesses. And the verdict strikingly exonerated the mill owners and the fire department because the granite mill was built according to the best plans then in use and the best safety equipment that was then in vogue. But because of this fire, the coroner's jury called for significant changes in, in safety and safeguards for mills. So... There were now laws and regulations on mill buildings that had to have more than one exit. The fire escapes must go to the top floor and be made of metal. Um, once automatic sprinkler systems are invented, they must be used. And laws that local governments had to conduct periodic inspections. This had never happened before. I mean, there were no rules about this. And safety devices on hand and operational and that, that the workers would be trained in order to help them survive their, if a fire happened again. So this was a significant fire, not only for its loss of life and the sad story that it tells, but also the good things that did come out of it. It's remarkable to me, though, that the man who was in charge of the mill manager who set the first fire alarm, he blamed the workers for their own deaths and had made some fantastical statements at the inquest about going upstairs and trying to convince them to leave, but they wouldn't leave their posts. But it would have been impossible for him to climb those stairs and then get back out because the fire was at that location and no one could get up or down. So his act of fictional heroic were never really called out. They just let people testify. And of course, he's, he was actually ordered by the mill owners to evacuate the product from the mill. So when they went back into the mill, the areas that they could get to, they saved the the cotton cloth that they were manufacturing and brought it out, not the people. That's incredible. And yet the mill owners were not held accountable because they did what they could and it was the best that they could do at the time, even though there were lies presented at the inquest and that they were really protecting themselves. So this was different from the uh, Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in New York of 1910 in that in that fire, there were clear violations of the fire safety laws. But here, mm-hmm. the, the mills actually were uh, complying with those laws, and therefore it was harder to... There weren't laws. That's the problem. There weren't laws. That There weren't safety laws in it. In a, in a, so they, they did... But they were doing bare minimums, even if... In today's society, that's a never... Even if there wasn't a law, you'd still be held accountable for common sense you know, workplace safety. But this was way before any of that. And the mill owners, they didn't want to to blame anybody for a sort of an act of, of an, an accident. But the mill owners blamed the workers, which I thought was incredibly, oh my God. I mean, can you imagine? You lose all these people, including in one family, you know, the loss of three, three siblings, three, three daughters who died in the same fire. Yeah. And, and yet, It's their fault. Okay, we have to take a break now. We've been talking to Dr. Stephanie Corey, the author of The Historic Fires of Fall River, available through the History Press and available on Amazon.com. Now here's a word from our sponsor, Nine Muses Books, and the Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Mystery Series. Nine Muses Books is proud to sponsor the Lizzie Borden Podcast. Nine Muses Books is an independent press featuring the Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Mystery Series written by author Richard Behrens. These well-crafted comic mysteries set a fictionalized Lizzie as a teenage detective against a real Victorian-era Fall River, Massachusetts. The characters are remarkably vivid, the narrative is intellectually stimulating, and as one critic has described it, author Author Richard Behrens really knows how to toss delightfully deceptive literary curveballs that keep the reader mystified until just that penultimate perfect moment. 
Michael Martins of the Fall River Historical Society has called these stories a must-read for all those intrigued by Fall River history, mystery, and, of course, Lizzie Borden. Shelley Diesick of the Lizzie Borden Warps and Wefts blog has written that the Lizzie Borden Girl Detective series are so much fun, it's nearly criminal. The Lizzie Borden Girl Detective mysteries can be found on Amazon in ebook format, and most books are offered as free downloads. In addition to these short stories, there is also the full length novel The Minuscule Monk, offered in both print book and ebook formats. For more information, go to lizzieborden.girldetective.com and sign up for our newsletter. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest, and listen to our podcasts on iTunes. Visit the Garden Bay Films channel on YouTube to see special visual editions of our podcasts, as well as the Lizzie Mini series. And now, back to the Lizzie Borden Podcast. Welcome back. We're talking to Dr. Stephanie Corey, the author of The Historic Fires of Fall River. We're jumping ahead quite a significant amount of time to 1916. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was, this was uh, between 1874 and 1916. A lot happened in Fall River. The city population had grown to roughly about 130,000. There had been uh, a vast expansion of the textile industry there. And a lot happened in the life of one Lizzie Borden between 1874 and 1916. In 1916, Lizzie Borden and her sister, who at that point was, of course, Lizbeth, and her sister, Emma, uh, owned considerable amount of property in town. So this was the first fire in which the property of the Borden family, the one that we're concerned with, was directly affected. Why do you consider the Steiger Store Fire of 1916 to be a major Fall River fire? Well, Basically because, like you said, Fall River was in its heyday. It was the the most populated time of the city. It never got higher than that, and it's only gone down from there. So it was the biggest moment, I guess, in the city's history, that period of time. We had 111 cotton mills with 4 million spindles and 37,000 operatives working in the mill. Weaving over 2,000 miles of cotton cloth a day. Let me say that again. They yeah. were weaving over <laughs> 2,000 miles of cotton cloth a day. Yes. And that doesn't count spinning yarn as thread. That's amazing to me. That's an enormous amount. And these workers were paid by the piece, not the hour, by the piece. That's why they're called Spindle City. Yes. The faster you worked, the more money you made, but it still was put you at a poverty level. So you could never break out. So there had been this big discussion in the months and years before this fire happened that South Main Street needed to be widened and the buildings needed to be put back to accommodate streetcars and motorized vehicles and sidewalks because parts of parts of Main Street were wide and parts of them were narrow. And it's interesting that this fire happened, and I'm not, I'm not actually, this is not a conspiracy. I'm not saying this had anything to do with it. It was just fortuitous for the city itself that that area that burned was the area exactly where the road needed to be widened. Uh, so after the fire, Fall River got its wide, wide avenue um, that continued up, that, or excuse me, down South Main. So it, it, they ended up being able to accommodate it. Before that, they couldn't because the buildings were right up to the street, the yeah. street side. So we're talking about an entire blocks framed by South Main, Spring, Pearl, and Columbia Streets were completely destroyed except for two buildings. And it almost took out St. Mary's Cathedral, which is on 2nd Street, which ties into the Lizzie Borden story again, because it's that to be first that Bridget Sullivan attended. Is it fair to say that this fire almost took out 92 2nd Street itself? It was headed in that direction, but no, it was it was a half a block away. But that that's still close. It is close. It is very close. They would have seen it from 2nd Street, definitely would have seen it from 2nd Street, because the block that we're talking about would have been in the burning area, would have been very visible from there. But this point in February of 1916, the house, was it still owned by the Borden sisters or had it been sold by then? I actually have it in my notebook here because I'm, I'm planning another primer in a couple of days. And, uh, uh, 1918, June of 1918, they sold 92 Second Street. So at the time of the fire, February 15th, 1916, it was half a block away from 92 Second Street, still owned by the Borden sisters, containing tenants who were renting the house from them. Half a block away, but half a block away in a block. So it was the block of, of Main, South Main Borden, 
Second Street and Spring. I see. So half of that block was destroyed by the fire. So they would have seen it from their Second Street house, but it was a half a block into that block in front of them. Right. At at this point, Emma was not living in Fall River. Lizzie was living no. on French Street, and the house on 90, 92 Second Street was being rented to tenants. They owned, they owned buildings on Spring Street, a building on Spring Street that was affected by the fire. And did this affect the Andrew J. Borden building on Anawan Street? No. No, it didn't go down that far. So the fire started on a Tuesday, February 15th, 1916, at the Steiger store. Could you explain to us what the Steiger store was? Well, it's amazing because uh, there's no more Steiger stores. And so I had to do a little bit of research to figure out what is a Steiger store. turns out it's named for a man, and he owned the Steiger store. And there is actually, I believe, one left in Massachusetts somewhere. But he, he was a store owner who built a store in Fall River. And it was a department store, a multi-level department store. That's where the fire started, near midnight, actually. And a young gentleman, a 43-year-old real estate agent, was walking home with his friends from the Young Men's Hebrew Association. And they had just crossed Spring Street. And he says, and I just, why I chanced to turn my head and look down the thoroughfare, I don't know. But almost at an instant, he says he saw smoke, which appeared to be coming from the side door of the basement of the store. And a little boy, he said, whom I do not know, exclaimed, there's a fire, get the fireman. And so he did that. He, Goldberg, his name was Ellis Goldberg. He broke the glass on box number 412, uh, South Main and Spring Street, and ran back to the side door of the building, um, looked in the basement window, and he was really glad he hadn't delayed. He didn't go look and then do the fire alarm. He did the fire alarm first and then went and looked. It was the perfect response to someone which later figures into a fire that I talk about in the book, the Notre Dame fire. If only that had happened as well, buildings surrounding the church might not have been destroyed and people might not have been made homeless by that fire. It's when people take it upon themselves to go investigate, to determine if it requires the fire department to come, that delay causes destruction. So he did the exact right thing. His first instinct was to report the fire and then go look at it. So that's what he did. And he noticed that the fire was in the building and the flames were shooting up the southwest corner of the basement. But he said four or five minutes later, the night watchman came out and asked him what was going on. The night watchman asked him what was going on. Yeah, what are you, what's going on? And he, he said that there's a fire in your building and the guy turned around and ran back into the building. And he said when the guy went back in, there was a real, it was a large explosion and then several other smaller explosions. And he thought for sure that the guy was consumed by those explosions, but he wasn't. The night watchman said a complete, his name was O'Rourke, a completely different story of what happened and where he was, right? Of course, he was not oblivious in his story. He was doing his job in his story. He reported it in his story when none of that really happened. So it's interesting. Because there's no science of fire investigation in 1916 like we have today, the eyewitness accounts are the most important to determine the cause of a fire and where a fire starts. This is before they could just, you know, like today with the fire that we have in Oakland, they can look at burn patterns and they can look whether it was started as an arson or whether it wasn't, whether it's electrical burn, you know, there's just so much science involved with fire investigation. But back then it was really about eyewitness accounts. So they initially believed that a boiler explosion in the basement caused the fire. So the Styrgo store was a three and a half story brick structure with a full basement and a sub basement. And each floor had about 10,000 square feet of space. And the store had just opened a year before and was still in the process of having its interior decorated with furniture, mirrors, and displays. And so a large amount of the general department store had stock on the premises. Because it had just opened, there were no working sprinklers, but complete system was being installed, but it wasn't connected yet to the city's water main. So there we have this sort of timing issue with what caused this to sort of spread with rapidity. The chief... engineer of the fire department was William Duvall, and he determined that a, that a general alarm was necessary, so he brought out the full firefighting force of the city by 1154. So we're talking within nine minutes. Because Goldberg did the right thing, within nine minutes, there were fire department from the entire city was actively fighting the fire. And it really is that timing that made this 
contained so perfectly. And because Duvall was a an expert fire engineer for the position that he had, he also had strategic ideas about how to fight this fire and how to contain it and how to use natural stops with street and ordered evacuations and made sure people were safe. And once again, there was no loss of life. And the, there was a response from other cities as well. Wasn't there fire apparatus and chiefs from other towns? Yeah, New Bedford, Newport, and Taunton each came. Each city sent two pieces of automobile apparatus, and all the fire chiefs came as well. This was another instance where the fire alarm issue had a problem. The alarm sounded with only four strikes indicating a general alarm, but it didn't follow through with the number of the box as is required. So they didn't know where this general alarm was. So Duvall immediately drove to the headquarters of City Hall just in case and directed Jeremiah Sullivan, who was the captain there, who later became the chief, who was the chief during the 1928 fire, to phone all the firehouses on the telephone to bring their apparatus because he didn't trust the system because something was not right. So people's instincts in this fire prevented this to become a major catastrophe. So when the fire started in the cyber store, the windows blew out because there wasn't working fire sprinklers. The flames jumped across Spring Street to the brick walls of the four-story Gamble building, Crespi's 5 and 10, two jewelers, two dentists, an optician, and the Knights of Columbus building went up. The awnings ignited and the fire went in through the windows of that building, the Campbell building. So actually the fire just flew in through the windows. And simultaneously the blaze went to the buildings owned by Lizzie and Emma Borden on the southeast corner of Spring and South Main. And all four corners of that of that uh, intersection went out completely enveloped with fire. The Campbell building had fire shutters, but they'd been left open. And if the shutters had been closed, there's little question that the fire would have been stopped at spring and eight buildings to the north would still be saved. So they sent patrolmen door to door around in residence, including the Hotel Lennox. There was 45 rooms to get everybody out of there. And because the fire spread so quickly, there were all these rumors that there was a lot of loss of life, but none of it was true. 25 minutes of the, yeah, fortunately, uh, after 25 minutes uh, from the first fire alarm, the Steiger store collapsed. Water seemed to make no difference. And the flying timbers and the brands expanded the fire area, and it was really hard to fight it. Police went to Pearl, 2nd, and 3rd Street to evacuate everyone. So that means that probably the board house on 2nd Street was evacuated during this fire because it was so close to the fire. They decided to make a decisive stand at the Edwards building on the corner of South Main in Columbia and just try to contain the fire. And he stationed his apparatus and firefighters to completely surround the block. The water was directed there in multiple streams from the roofs of other buildings down onto buildings. And it was very slow progress. McQuare's, which was deemed probably most famous store down in that area, which was directly connected to this fire area, They were equipped with exterior sprinkler systems that had been turned on early, preventing the sparks from igniting the store. And there was only minor water damage to that building, and it was open for business the next day. That's McWare's, the department store. Right. So it it was safe because they had the proper equipment. They had invested in protecting the building. When you invest in protecting a building with fire fighting safety equipment, you're not only protecting your own business, you're protecting the spread of the fire further. So businesses that did this, that protected their own docks, their own businesses, actually aided the entire city in not spreading the fire. So there's more than just a self-interest in a company being properly equipped to fight a fire in its own building or to protect itself. So there was a building called the Morris Paint Store on Spring Street, and they were afraid that if it caught fire, that the flammable materials in there would destroy St. Mary's Cathedral, which is right next door. And so they were doing everything they could to stem the fire that. But luckily, there were only minor explosions, and it didn't threaten the church that much. So they were over upset about this paint store exploding and destroying the cathedral, but it didn't happen. And by 3 a.m., the fire was under control. It did a lot of damage, but again, no loss of life, thank goodness. Well, one aspect of it that that strikes people as kind of eerie comes from the photographs, because the photographs were taken in the middle of the night, and there were zero-degree temperatures. So you have this strange landscape where people are fighting this fire with water. The water is almost immediately turning to icicles, and it creates kind of an apocalyptic feel when you look at the photographs. It does. These were the photographs taken by Leslie Jones from the Boston Herald? Yes. 
it's otherworldly to have all this ice and fire. And when the water is being blasted out of the fire hoses, it's freezing onto the buildings because of the temperatures. So you're creating this sort of scary landscape with debris piling up that's encrusted with ice, that's encrusted with millions of gallons of water that's then freezing immediately. So even though the fire was hot, the frozen landscape is just striking. All in all, 50 buildings were involved and loss in millions of dollars was uh, a million dollars in losses. And yet not a single loss of life? Nope, not a single loss of life. And it, it's interesting because immediately following the fire, um, twenty in the week that followed, 20,000 people visited the fire in order to, you know, the fire area in order to, like, as a little tourist attraction, you know, to come look at what the destruction was. Well, it started around midnight and it was under control by 3 a.m. So we're talking about a three-hour fire. Positive factors were uh, a strong southeast wind at the beginning that had let up, and the snow from the recent storm had covered the roofs of, of certain buildings, including St. Mary's. So it was a natural protection against the firebrands and embers that shot around. So there was less chance of things igniting from fire that wasn't directly sprayed into an open window or hit on a roof that way. Um, all the businesses, uh, all the big businesses that were uh, affected were rebuilt. Albert Steiger, the founder of the store, arrived at 3 a.m. and he set up an office at the Hotel Mellon. And he had never, he said he had never had a fire start any of his stores. And so he vowed to rebuild and he did. And he was in Fall River for another 20 years, all in all 20 years. His motto for his store, his tagline for his store was, your money's worth or your money back, which I really like. I think that's kind of cool. <laughs> Yeah, well, he couldn't have a fire sale at the in 1916 because there was no more merchandise left. Right. Well, interesting. Um, the most burned area was included in the, what's called the congested value district yeah. from the National Board of Fire Underwriters, which the year before had issued a report on the buildings in Fall River and where where the worst catastrophes could happen and where it would cost the most money. And it was interesting that the highest potential hazard area for fire was exactly this area the block founded by Maine, Columbia, Pearl, and Spring. Yeah, so they decided that it was of mysterious origin and not arson at all. And right away, they started talking about widening the road, setting back the businesses, which they did, increasing the sidewalks. That's why today you can get a parking spot on South Main Street. Mm, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> well, ever since the courthouse went up. Yeah, really. And how long did it take to rebuild this district? One year? It, it's interesting how quickly things can get rebuilt back then. In the 1843 fire that we talked about earlier, it only took a year to rebuild that entire area and make it better. All of it. In the, the Steiner Storm fire, it took a little over a year. But again, very quickly, things were restored, rebuilt, reconstruction. Now we're talking not only that, but we have to take out all the rubble that was there before. So there's the demolition, there's the hauling off of all of the of the demolition and what's left of the fire and then the rebuilding. And so yeah, within probably a year it was the city was back to normal. So don't you wish you can you could take some of those uh construction crews, put them in a time machine and bring them the current day and get them to work on the Braga Bridge. It's not the construction crew's fault that the Braga Bridge is still under construction. It's a system of perpetual employment that is common throughout the country. It's not that they're going slowly. It's that it's on purpose takes forever because you're employing people. I know. I At one point in New York City, I worked for the School Construction Authority, and there were plans to put up lighting systems in schoolyards that was costing millions of dollars and taking five or six years. Yeah. It's incredible. It, it puts people to work, but it's, it's ridiculous how long it takes to build a bridge nowadays, to do an overpass. It's ridiculous. And it didn't, you, you, you and I both know it doesn't take that long. They could get it done in six weeks, but instead it takes six years because I don't want to blame anybody, but it's a rigged system. I mean, I'm not going to say it's the unions that are doing it. I'm not going to say it's the government. There's the overspend because it takes a hundred times longer than it should in order to do anything these days. Yeah. But back then they just needed it done and they got it done. I yeah. mean, it wasn't, that's a reasonable amount of time to restore a business district is a year. And they weren't working fast. They were just working regularly. 
Okay, we're jumping now from 1916 to 1928, which is only about 12 years later, for what has been called the greatest calamity that has ever visited Fall River, the Great Fire of 1928. What do you know about that story? Oh, this is this could be a book in and of itself. Um, there's so much to tell. There's so much, so many photographs were taken. So even film that was interestingly showed like two days later in the movie theaters. So it was the largest Fall River, the fire in Fall River. The affected area was the largest. The amount of loss was largest. There was, again, no loss of life. It's incredible considering, but it was mainly businesses, not where people lived. So we're talking about the major downtown area was affected. Uh, at 1928, that was a large, much larger area than 1843. But it, the same general specific area, though, interestingly, it burned again. It started at 6.15 p.m. on February 2nd. It was a Thursday in the evening. In February in the evening at 6.15, it's starting to get dark. In the winter, it's dark at 4.30 and the circulation manager and his assistant from the Fall River Herald building were leaving the building and they were walking up the street and they noticed a flickering light in the windowless Pocasset Mill number two, which was just one of five structures between Pocasset and Central Street that was currently um, being dismantled. The Pocasset Mill was in the process of being dismantled and they saw a glow that grew brighter and more radiant, which they thought, oh, there's a fire. And again, they quickly reported it to a patrolman who was walking the beat who immediately went and spread the fire alarm. Now, we're in the downtown area. The fire department is across the street, generally speaking. Uh, the city hall is across the street from this area. So we've got the major government and business concerns are in this area where this happens. So the Cassett Mill was in the process of being torn down. And in that process of being torn down, its fire sprinkler system had been removed. So there was no way to fight the fire on the scene in the buildings that were there. Because of this problem that eventually happened, laws were passed where even if you were tearing down a building in Fall River, you had to maintain fire safety and fire protection until the building itself is destroyed. So what they had done was they took out the water, they took out the piping, they took out all that stuff first and gutted the building, and then the structure was left. They think that the fire started by some workers who were trying to heat themselves by putting a fire in a barrel and warming themselves on it and then walking away thinking they had put the fire out. When they hadn't, the floor caught fire from all the, the uh, oils in the wood, again, caused by machinery that had been soaked into the ground and the fire spread from there. So that's where they presume it started, and that's what they believe happened. So the fire raged for more than eight hours. It was a very long fire. It involved 348 firefighters and 41 apparatus, 22 different cities as far away as Boston. And they worked in zero-degree temperatures. And we've got a winter fire where the temperatures and the wind play a very important and striking role disastrous contribution to the severity of the fire. In all in all, 36 buildings were leveled, destroying 261 individual businesses in six square blocks of the city. We've got three hotels destroyed, seven banks, two theaters, a newspaper building, and several large business blocks. So a thousand people were instantly unemployed. 250 people were hospitalized, 20 overnight, with some firefighters with some frostbite and some broken bones, but there was no loss of life. So the damage was estimated in $35 million, and that's about $500 million in today's money. But it was really an accident waiting to happen, and because the buildings were not properly protected. There had been rules and laws passed for new construction, but they allowed the old construction to continue grandfathered in to the old rules of construction. They didn't retrofit buildings with fire stop and firewalls, and they didn't require fire apparatus within the buildings themselves and sprinkler systems. So it was happenstance. So the older buildings were definitely aided in spreading the fire. The newer buildings with fire stops helped to stop the fire. The, the streets had been widened, you know, as we said from before, but we're talking about North Main, which is a different part of Main Street. It's from where Main Street becomes South Main Street and North. The 1916 fire was south of that area. So the streets weren't wide enough for the flames not 
to just cross the street with a strong wind and start fires across the street. So the inconsistent fire stops and fire safety equipment in the buildings themselves caused problems. Now, properly protected buildings that were equipped with wire glass windows and pin clad shutters and open sprinkler systems and automatic sprinkler systems adjacent to windows with firewalls, they were protected and they had minimal damage. So there was there were buildings that were saved because of that. The central firehouse with the fire engine was located right behind City Hall was only 800 feet away from where this fire started. The fire chief, as I said, was Jeremiah Sullivan. He had been the captain during the 1916 fire. And he called a general alarm and requested calls to be made for nearby assistance immediately. But it would be four days later before the last fire apparatus could be removed where the fire was considered completely put out four days. Outside apparatus from other cities began to arrive as early as 7.45 p.m. The fire department had eight motor pumps, ladder trucks, hose wagons, and combination vehicles. Luckily, four years earlier, Fall River had converted its equipment to this national standard for hose coupling, where anybody's fire hose can connect to anybody else's fire hydrant, and it would work. So that was a standardization of like the threading of the fire hose to attach to the fire hydrants. Now, Newport was the only city that sent fire equipment that didn't have the coupling thread, but they had their own adapters. So everybody was able to connect to the hydrant in Fall River, which was very, very helpful. But the hoses that were first laid in the in the first fighting of the fire were immediately froze to the street, and they had to be abandoned. So we had this system where they had to keep bringing in new hose. That's why they needed more and more fire departments to come in because their hose would freeze and they'd have to abandon it because they couldn't even lift it because it was it was frozen to the ground and the water in it was frozen. Now, it, Mrs. Uh, Florence Cook Brigham, who was the curator of the Fall River Historical Society from 1976 to 1990, she was but a 28-year-old young woman during the fire and her husband, Richard Curtis Bur- Brigham, was a local weather observer for the U.S. Weather Bureau, and his station was at the top of the Mohican Hotel on the water on the roof where there was a water a weather tower. So she has an interesting stories where she related in the newspaper about her husband and what was going on that day. She said, he told me, meaning her husband, he told me that one of the firemen said it was going to be a humdinger. I was scared to death. I thought the whole city was doomed. It was terrible, really terrible. The only thing that kept us warm was the fire, but we had to keep moving back as it spread. So it was so cold. And and also interesting is that she was 28 at this time, and later she was to become the curator of the Historical Society. The Historical Society's offices were located in the Buffington building that was affected by the fire. And that was where the Historical Society had their their collection. That building was engulfed in fire, but was able to be rebuilt. In other words, the building itself structurally was undamaged. The interiors of most of the buildings were destroyed, including the Historical Society's collection. Oh, so the only that. thing that was saved was what was in a safe. Yeah. And that proved to be the case throughout the city that the fire safes were highly successful in protecting money, documents, and and other items that were put into fire safes. So there was this big, there's a whole lot of uh, fire insurance uh, brochures that came out after this showing the destruction and then the safe in the rubble and then opening the safe and everything inside the safe. <laughs> Why it's called a safe, right? Exactly. So, um, yeah, so there was a big success for these safe companies that had secured the contents of these important contents uh, from this fire. So the society's collection was completely destroyed except for whatever was in the Herring Hall and Marvin safe. Now, because this fire started, we know where it started, but the exact sequence can't be determined precisely because the wind was whooshing around and carried these burning embers to wooden roofs and controlling it was quite impossible that we know what burned and we sort of know a sequence of events, but we don't know exactly, exactly what happened. The Herald News Building, which was right across the street from the Pocasset Mill, was of newer construction. It had a complete automatic sprinkler system with 32 sprinkler heads near the windows and it was saved. The only thing that burned and fell was the exterior cornice, and the interior suffered only minor water damage. 
that was right next to the fire and it survived. So you can see how it was important that these buildings be maintained and preserved with retrofitting, but it didn't happen in most of the other buildings. Well, between the two fires, between 1916 and 1928 fires, buildings that surprisingly survived, some of which have relevance to the Lizzie Borden story, is the City Hall building, 92 Second Street itself, St. Mary's Cathedral, the Academy building, and the A.J. Borden building. They they all survived between these two fires. They they all survived. Well, the the this fire wasn't anywhere near Second Street. This fire was was a block up and over. So it was Second Street was never in danger in this fire. Although I'm sure people were worried because of the wind, they didn't know where it would go. But we have, to, we have we can give thanks to the Boston Fire Department for protecting City Hall because they set up a perimeter around it and made sure that the flames never got to City Hall and completely uh, threw water on it during the entire process. So they were the protectors of our City Hall. And right across the street from there, the banks were decimated, were burned up, and the roofs collapsed. And But they protected City Hall, which is good. Only for them, to, for us to destroy City Hall in the 60s to build a highway. Yeah. <laughs> is that the block across from the current City Hall where the flagpoles are? That's the area that you're talking about? Where the flagpoles are right now, that would have been where the granite block was. That would have been where uh, behind that was the uh, Pocasset Mill. If you look at where the Herald News building is now, Think across the street from that. And when the Picasso Mill burned down, there was also a liberation of some of the waters from the Quickishan River. Mount. Yes, and it would have been the first time in a long time that people had seen the falls because the Quickishan River had been quite polluted from, from the mills that had used it. And after a while, they didn't need the water from the river in order to operate mills with electricity. And so they put the actual river in underground and piped it and this revealed it for the first time in a generation. Yeah, there's a spectacular photograph of that, that that's available. One bizarre story about this fire that I like to end on is the um, the Madame Tussauds exhibit. Yeah, that's a crazy <laughs> story. There was a, a Madame Tussauds Museum of Celebrities in Wax had an exhibit in the granite block. Now the granite block was a block of, it was a Big, big block that had multiple offices and businesses in it that sat uh, east, uh, yeah, east of the Picasso Mill. So behind the granite block was the Picasso Mill. Okay, so in that building there was an exhibit, and the manager of that exhibit angered a group of firemen really early because he was really stubborn. He said he was not he was gonna remain in his ticket booth in case patrons wanted to view the wax figures. Like he figured <laughs> that he could be it was like P. T. Barnum, like it'll bring people downtown and into my exhibit. Watch Queen Elizabeth melt. <laughs> yeah, really. Well he, the firemen ordered them to leave and none too gently they removed all the wax figures to the street and dropped them onto the ground without a thought and went back in and got more and dropped them out. And bystanders believed that they were bringing out bodies of victims. And they called ambulances, and so there were rumors that circulated that there were all these mass, mass casualties. And there weren't, of course. And the wax figures were then carried. He made them carry them to the Metacomet Bank and lined up facing away from the street till he could run and find a place where he could store these things because it was his livelihood. And he went in search of a safe place. And a police officer was walked by and mistook the dummies in the smoke and the darkness for people and ordered them to move along there, move along, <laughs> move along. You can't stand here. It's not recorded what happened when he realized that indeed they were wax figures and not real people. It would be nice if, uh, if that exhibit had a chamber of horrors and one of the statues was Jack the Ripper. <laughs> that would be fairly amazing. Or Lizzie Borden even. Yeah, Lots really. Fairly, yeah. Yeah, just as a side note, Lizzie Borden had died very recently before this. This was February of 1928. And when did she die? Didn't she die June? Well, let's see. Her um, her funeral was on June 4th. So you're right. She died in June. She was operated on February of 26th. That's where February stuck in my head. So this Great Fire of 1928 was February of 28th. And Lizzie Borden had been had passed away about roughly eight months earlier. Yeah, so you can't blame it on her. No, no. And uh, <laughs> it might not have been time for Madame Tussauds to make a wax statue of her. 
one last fire I'd like to squeeze in. We only have about five minutes, but I'd like to squeeze in the uh, Notre Dame fire of 1982. You said in one of your lectures that this was the most emotional loss experienced by the city. Now, why was this fire different in terms of the emotional impact? That I mean, I know that the earlier fires had, had vast impact, but in 1982, this fire of Notre Dame was considered a, an emotional loss experienced by the city. Could you explain that? Well, the newspaper that came out the next day, the headline read, The Day a City Wept. The Notre Dame Cathedral was the largest, most significant structure, I think, in the city, the most famous structure. You could see it from miles away. As you were heading into the city, you could see it up on the hill. It was massive. It had 235-foot copper sheathed twin spires. It was 100 feet wide, 235 feet long. It was an enormous building. It was a cathedral. It was the center of, of a religious community for the French-Canadian population of the city in the Flint area of the city, in the eastern portion of the city. It was a home parish to a large portion of the population in that area, and it meant a lot to them. And it was right in the middle of a residential area. So when the fire broke out, they had to evacuate 75 families in the neighboring area. I guess the only lucky part of it was that it was during the daytime. And if it had been at night, it would have been a completely different story. People were at work. They were awake. They were able to evacuate. There was no loss of life once again. But there was a big destruction. The church itself was completely destroyed. They said that walking into this church when it existed was like walking into heaven. It was magnificent in all regard. It had been undergoing a renovation, which is pretty much how the fire got started. The first alarm was set out at 2.25 p.m. from the on-site trailer. It involved 350 firefighters, 34 fire departments, 50 fire engines, 16 ladder trucks. This was another indication, another fire, where communities from all around came to help. It started when the wooden fascia board behind the gutters ignited during construction work. The flames spread across the roof of the church and into the twin steeples, which soon toppled onto the roofs of buildings next door. It's, they said it spread faster than you could run. There were strong winds blowing from the north down, and it spread the fire toward Pleasant Street. There was problems with water pressure in the lines, some faulty fire hydrants, and there were some communication problems. And the heat was so intense and the wind was so strong that it created its own wind system called a firestorm. This was a case where the fire started... The guy came, came down and reported it to the man who was in charge of the church, who then went all the way up there to look and see what was going on, decided to call the fire department, and then they called the fire department. The chief of the fire department said that this is the exact wrong thing to do, that the first thing you do is call the fire department and let us figure it out. You're not equipped to know, and it's that delay caused this massive destruction, not of the church itself, which was destined to be destroyed quickly, but of the surrounding neighborhood, which was catastrophic for those that lived in that area. They considered that there was probably an hour-long pre-burn, and the wood behind the gutter could have been exposed for a while to heat generated by soldering or re related operations. And he said, in such a case, a chemical decomposition of the wood begins, the ignition temperature is steadily lowered, Wood starts to glow and sets up fire stage of flaming combustion, which is the visual, visible fire itself. So there had been, this delay was crucial, and the fire had made a considerable headway in the loss before it was even noticed. The damage was massive in terms of money. Uh, there was no loss of life. 300 people were homeless because of it. Eight small businesses destroyed. 12 commercial buildings damaged. The church itself was destroyed. It was a disaster, not only emotionally, but in terms of the city itself, it was an expensive fire for the city. And this was a great fire that lingers in the memory of the current generation of people in Fall River. Uh, yes, because we now have, we have video. People took video of it. There were color images that were recorded. Everybody had their cameras out. So it was one of those cases where not only did it affect people's memories of their childhood or their youth or their young lives, with this destruction of this 
building and the surrounding area, but there's records of it that we didn't have in other fires. There's photographic evidence, there's videotape that's on YouTube of the actual fire. There are people who are still alive, of course, from this fire in 1982. It was documented. And it, when you document something like that, it creates memories in and of themselves. Like, you know, you take family photos and you look at them later and you remember what happened. So because there's all this photographic evidence, there's this deeper emotional memory about what happened during this fire. Well, Stephanie, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing with us your book, The Historic Fires of Fall River, which is available from the History Press. And Amazon.com. And Amazon.com. And I hope you're uh, willing to come back onto the show and talk more about Fall River history and talk about our pet project, which is Lizzie Borden. Absolutely. Anytime, Richard. Anytime. Okay. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Richard. This podcast was produced by Nine Muses Books and engineered by Mason Amadeus. The theme music was composed and performed by Melora Krieger. The Lizzie Borden Podcast is sponsored by Nine Muses Books and the Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Mystery Series. More information can be found at lizziebordenpodcast.com and lizziebordengirldetective.com.